couple of speakers tonight who, ironically, and this is a segue I'm coming for, were also at the ENR Crane Night. Well, they have been on a massive journey over the last 18 months. It's Michael and Sarah Feeney. They're doing a massive amount of information uploading. They're on Facebook. Some brilliant comments and photos. So as I said, it, they're interesting to get in because they are ex-police. So it's ironic in a room full of conspiracy <laughs> theories. <laughs> I might as well get it out there. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't know I'm MI5. So. <laughs> Ex-police, and as I said, it's interesting to be able to yeah, perceive <laughs> what people within certain sectors of society are thinking at the same time as we are, because we kind of think we're a bit separate and distant from it. And as I said, it's interesting. Also, a few of you already think there's a couple of police in here, so it's just double the number. So I want to, as I said, introduce them and then at break time uh, we'll do about 45 minutes or 50 minutes and then at break time uh, we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll try and get in punctual <laughs> <laughs> there is no time um, and do another 45 minutes to an hour and a few questions and I think Kerry wants to say something about the fluoride action group that I meet is at break time as well so Michael and Sarah thank you very much thank you. Good morning, I'll get back. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like I've been back on. <laughs> well, thank you very much for, for attending this evening. I talk beyond the illusion, the time of awakening. And the, the title of that will become relevant during the talk. We're Michael and Sarah, and tonight we're going to be talking about lots and lots of different things. But on the face of it, it may seem like the different things, but actually just one thing. It'd be from spirituality to paranormal, supernatural, pyramids, UFO, uh, UFOs, and basically everything that comes from our experience over the last two years, either from personal experience or from research. We'll uh, invite any questions at the end or during the break or, or whatever. If, if somebody doesn't want to speak in an open forum, come and, come and corner us uh, even in the break or later. So as it's already been said, myself and Sarah actually were ex-police officers. <coughs> And I started in the 1990s with the Metropolitan Police in London, and that is PLS, the Hendon Police Training Centre. And so that was in the, the early 90s. Now, it was an 18 week rigorous course, uh, basically Monday to Friday, go on the weekends, weekly exams, uniform inspections every morning at 7 o'clock on the parade square. We, we had to pass the exams, it was a 35% failure, so it was quite, quite rigorous. Following the passing out parade, uh, following 18 weeks of training, I was stationed in North London, around Tottenham and all around that area. So I did uh, several years there, but because I'm not from London, I'm actually from the Midlands, and because I was missing family and I wanted to come home, I actually came back to the West Midlands Police and was stationed not too far from even Kingston in and Irvington, where I spent several more years of service. A couple of years later, Sarah actually joined the police, and there's the Taliyah Training Centre, which is again is not too far from here in Espaston, where Sarah actually did her training. She was uh, miraculously <coughs> put to the same same station, and eventually we got put on the same shift, and we actually occasionally worked worked together, and we got to know each other that way, and we, we got to know each other more, uh, spending 12 hours in the back of a ride van during the Answorth rides. And that's when we actually romantically got to know each other the most. <laughs> we, did. we did nevertheless actually we did, we did actually join to help people. You know, most most frontline police officers do. You know, you get the, the occasional pee girls, you get the occasional people joining for the wrong reasons, but most people actually join for the right reasons, that is to help people. Up until about the last 12, 15 months of service, that's exactly what we were doing and as far as we were concerned, it was the best job in the world. You know, it's what took me probably probably eight, ten years to get in. So, you know, it was the best job in the world. Probably two years before we left, things started to get a bit ridiculous and crime figures were being manipulated on a, on a daily basis to make believe that crime was actually being reduced when it wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, emergency response times were actually being manipulated to make <coughs> it look like we were meeting targets and we weren't. Me personally, we're answering 999 emergency calls three or four days later. And basically, our arms were tied behind our back and we were not providing, providing a public service. We were told by the senior management not to stop people we knew were carrying drugs for argument's sake because it reflected bad on the crime figures. And 
you know, we were police officers joined to do for the right reasons, and we couldn't do it. So we began to get a bit, well, negative, we began to get a bit sick of it really, and we decided that we wanted to leave. And because we were becoming problem, you know, problematic to them, we were actually standing up and speaking against the system and saying, you know, why are we doing it this way? It doesn't make sense, it's backwards. We were actually put on the spotlight and because we were troublesome to the senior management team, uh, speaking our minds and telling them that their, their system is ridiculous, they actually tried to split us up and put us on different shifts so we wouldn't see each other because as a two some we were a fighting force as an individual, you know, we were voiceless. So that's what they tried to do to us. And basically we decided that enough was enough and we were going to leave. We were actually having a, a spiritual awakening at the same time and everything considered. Uh, we had a choice to make and that was our choice. We could either stop where we were and have a breakdown because it was really, really making us ill. Or we could have a new life for ourselves and break, and break free. As I say, we were having a spiritual awakening at the time. But before we actually get into that, it's quite important to, to take you back to our childhood because that's when it really, really started for us. Okay, um, so as you say, going back to childhood is really important for us. Um, from a very early age, both Mick and I were very aware that there was so much more to life, and probably most of the people in this room feel the same. It was just something, you know, me from the sort of age of around five years of age, I just remember thinking to myself that it just seemed bizarre that people just seemed to run around working all day and that was that was life and then you know one day that's the end you know they pop their clogs and they haven't really done a lot with their lives and it, it just seemed wrong it seemed really really um strange and backwards to me and having discussed it between us we both feel the same and we know that from the same sort of age we both felt the same about this but um where i grew up was very very um haunted in one respect, but there was a lot of stuff that used to happen where I grew up. But I just want to obviously read this bit. It says, It is generally accepted that children are the most psychic people on earth up to around the age of seven years old and can see both the physical and non-physical world. Well, where I grew up, that's very, very true. Um, there's me, there's my older sister and my younger brother. And all three of us growing up in the place that we grew up in, which is in Kingston, not too far from here, uh, things would happen all of the time. Uh, some of the things were really, really beautiful. I mean, I can remember some amazing experiences from, again, the age of about uh, two to three years of age. Uh, my mum or my dad would take me to bed. They would, uh, you know, read me a little story, turn the lights off and go. And at that point, I was very aware of what was about to happen because for, for many nights on the trot, I used to get these beautiful coloured orbs that would wait, it seemed that they would wait for my parents to disappear. And then they would come and appear at the window, the bedroom window, uh, and come in through the window, which was closed, and then fly around the room and interact with me. It seemed like they were playing with me and, you know, trying to get me off to sleep almost. And uh, they were absolutely beautiful, like pastel colours, you know, pinks, purples, greens, blues, all really, really beautiful things. And uh, I was also aware that there was a lady with wings that used to sit at the end of the bed, an angel, and um, again, would seem to sort of, you know, want to get me off to sleep. And uh, at the point where I started to feel tired, they would sort of gather together, we'd have one last little play and then fly off back through the windows. And uh, I'd go off to sleep. And uh, one day I was watching um, the telly and I saw uh, something on about fireflies. And I thought, they look like what I'm seeing in the bedroom. And, you know, again at the age of three, going on four, because this happened for quite a while. Um, and so I started associating these, uh, these orbs with fireflies and I used to call them the fireflies. And I would, uh, I would tell my parents about them. I would say how the fireflies have been again. You know, they were playing with me last night. One day we were out in the car uh, at night time and I was in the back. And uh, all of a sudden they appeared at the window of the car. And, uh, you know, I could see them playing as day as if, you know, really almost physical, like physical orbs almost, beautiful colours. And they would fly and try and keep up with each other uh, next to the window. And I'd say to my mum who was sitting in front of me, oh, the fireflies are here again. And she would look. And she'd be like, where, where? And then she was looking in the sky, thinking maybe I was seeing some UFOs or something. And she couldn't see them, but she knew that I was telling the truth because she was you know, quite switched on to this stuff as well. She's had many experiences. Uh, but this went on for quite some time. And uh, it was, as I say, it was absolutely beautiful to be able to remember that. So I knew again from a very early age that there was more to life 
than what we can see with the physical. Um, and as it says there, generally around the age of seven, children start to lose these abilities. Uh, one, I suppose, because it's not really accepted in today's society, but it is also, um, you know, it's kind of kicked out of us, you know, we're told uh, by family or friends, oh, don't be silly, there's no such thing as a ghost, it's just your imagination, and, you know, oh, don't worry about it. And you end up sort of forgetting about it. Um, but these experiences stayed. Um, now, there were other experiences that took place here. Uh, again, really sort of important to me because it kind of uh, moulded my view of reality really from a very early age. Um, there was, as I say, it was quite haunted. I mean, there was a lot of things that happened. Uh, bumps in the night, uh, people, or certainly somebody going around calling my name in the night. Other people would hear this as well. Um, but there would be nobody there. My mum would get up and check. She'd even go outside thinking that there was somebody, you know, trying to call me from outside. This is like the early hours of the morning. Um, probably in the age of six or seven, and uh, you know, to find nothing. So we knew there was stuff going on. Um, the most significant event that took place, which was very relevant to mine and Mick's awakening, is um, the ghost of a girl. And her name is Sarah Jensen. Now, the top left picture is where I grew up. My house was just the other side of that, uh, that field there. And uh, there's a lot of history to that area, and it's quite significant. And um, there was a lot of stuff that used to take place. Um, now, one morning um, at the age of 10, my younger brother, who was three at the time, uh, we were both sort of lying in bed waiting for our mum to bring us breakfast in bed. And all of a sudden, he started to say to me, You look like Sarah Jensen. And it really took me back because Kevin, my brother, he, um, he had a lot of speech problems. He was, uh, you know, a speech impediment. He'd only just started getting used to using people's first names, and it just wasn't him. It was completely out of the blue. It was weird. It just wasn't right. And um, and he kept saying, "You look like Sarah Jensen," but then he would start giggling and laughing as if he'd, he'd done something wrong. And it seemed he was playing some little game with somebody. And um, and so I questioned him on it. I mean, I probed him. I asked him, you know, what who is she? How do you know her? And you know, is somebody a friend? Somebody you know from the street? And he would just keep saying no and just keep laughing. And it was, uh, you know, really sort of starting to freak me out. My mum came into the room, uh, you know, I let her know what he was saying, and she did the same. She started probing him. And uh, she got the same response. I mean, he kept saying to her, she's over there, she's over there, and now she's moved now because you've stood by her, and now she's in the mirror. So there was something really significant about this, I and mean, you could feel that there was a lot sort of building up. There was things going on around us that just, uh, you know, very out of the ordinary. And um, we left it at that for a while. Kevin did used to see a lot of things um, back in the house. And um, <coughs> it kind of got left unsaid for a little while. But um, then my mum did some research into, uh, into this girl. Um, it got, we got the name, Sarah Jensen. And um, she managed to actually find out that there was a Jensen family that lived within the area. And that there was a young girl called Sarah Jensen. And that the story was that she had gone blind from a uh, viral disease and that she died mysteriously but there was a lot of uh, mystery surrounding her death. So it was, um, again, it was, it was really strange to sort of have this confirmed, you know, my little brother had seen this little girl, Sarah Jensen, named her, pointed to her and then my mum went and confirmed that there was actually Sarah Jensen, a uh, girl that lived there. So um, it always stood out to me, never felt like it had completely gone away, even as I was growing up. I always used to tell this Sarah Jensen story because it had stuck with me. And I always felt that there was so much more to it. And um, so uh, years went by, um, you know, occasionally I would tell the story. But really, to cut a very long story short, uh, when we and Mick got together, we went to see uh, a medium. And this medium confirmed to, to, to us that there was a girl called Sarah Jensen around us and that she wanted help and um, she was very adamant that she was here for us and she wanted uh, us to look into her death. Um, apparently she'd been around me for a long time since childhood, that there was something about me she liked. She said she, she said exactly the same as what my brother said, she said she looks a lot like you and she likes you a lot and she's actually attached to you. And that didn't really mean anything to me at the time because I didn't know anything about spirit attachments. Um, you know, energies or anything like that. I was just aware that there was this ghost girl and there was obviously a story building up. And um, 
we said, okay, um, you know, being good natured police officers, we thought we can help this girl, we'll see what we can do, we'll have a look into it, see if we can, you know, find anything out about it and maybe solve, solve a mystery. Um, the medium confirmed to us that Sarah Jensen had been taken by another's hand and she said that what that means is she was murdered, which is something that I suspected all along. Um, so off we went. Um, she told us that if we wanted any help with Sarah in the future, then um, just to get in touch with her and she'd come and help send her on into the light. Again, that didn't mean a great deal to us at the time, but we have a vague idea of what it meant. And uh, she'd asked if we'd been having any problems at home, in our own home, and um, we had. You know, we'd had uh, windows all of a sudden break from the inside for no reason, pictures falling off the shelves and landing face down, which she said is a sign of when you've got a negative entity and negative energy around you. And um, all these things were taking place. But we thought we'll, we'll give it a go, we'll see what we can do. We went to Birmingham Library and we spent three or four hours in there trying to search for all the, all the death records to see if we could locate this Sarah Jensen uh, girl. Uh, not a trace, we couldn't find anything kind of. Um, so we went away, you know, we didn't really know what else we could do. It kind of got sort of swept under the carpet for quite a while. And then, um, and then it kept popping up, it just kept popping up. But, you know, she'd pop into my head as if, you know, almost like a reminder that, you know, I'm still here, get it sorted. You said she was going to help me, now get it sorted. Um, and time went by, we just, you know, we got to a point where it was, there was nothing more we could do. We decided that we were going to um, speak to the medium and get her to come and send Sarah Jensen on into the light. We were out having a meal when we made this decision. At the point when we got home, the whole atmosphere changed. Everything um, was different. Everything went very eerie. Uh, came in and stood by a radiator and it just went off. It went cold. Um, the whole atmosphere of the house changed. It was very, you know, edgy, very on edge. Um, and then all of a sudden Mick's mood changed. Mick went very uh, snappy and very aggressive. Uh, vocally aggressive, and I knew that it wasn't him. I knew there was something, um, you know, manipulating him to behave like this. And um, we could just tell that we'd upset, you know, whoever was around us. So um, we decided that, okay, we'll call the medium. Mick got on the phone to, uh, to the medium, explain what was happening. And um, she said, okay, I can come round tomorrow morning and uh, we'll clear her for you. Everything went calm at that point for us because um, Sarah apparently had gone to, uh, travelled like, you know, in, uh, down the phone line almost to the medium and was giving her a jeep and she was saying that Sarah Jensen is saying, you said you're going to help her and you haven't done anything, you know, she's getting quite angry about it. So we explained, you know, almost having an argument with this guy, so, you know, we tried, what, what more can we do? Um, you know, we've got nothing to go on. Anyway, we left it at that. Uh, she was going to come round and we were going to get it sorted. We couldn't relax, however, um, you know, again, it was so edgy, the atmosphere was cold, it was, it was just not very nice. We, uh, we'd normally be in our pyjamas at about, you know, five o'clock on the weekend when we got home, um, but we just sat there in our clothes <coughs> on the edge of the seat because we couldn't relax, we just wanted to get the night over with and, um, you know, get the medium to come around and sort it out. And about ten o'clock, um, all of a sudden, I smelt this waft of flowers beautiful flowers, you know, sort of waft past, and then mix melt it as well. And we just thought, that's it, that's enough. We're getting out of this place for the night. We'll go to my mum's house, because she knows all about this story. And uh, that's what we did. We, we went upstairs and packed a bag. Um, it was almost like we were being forced out of our own house. And uh, we made the journey to my mum's house, where we thought everything would be fine, you know, we just waited out till the next morning, and that would be that. But, you know, we were wrong. <coughs> Um, yeah, so there we go, we got to our mum's house and um, explained to her what was going on. She understood, she knew we weren't mad because she'd experienced it for herself and she was very open to this stuff. And um, we, uh, we were sleeping in the downstairs, uh, recently converted garage, everything seemed funky dory. Um, but then we went to bed, it was about uh, half past one in the morning we went to bed and then at about uh, 20 past, 25 past three, what happened to us next was absolutely terrifying. It's something that, you know, really sort of scarred us for a little while and we had to get over, but it was um, something we, had, we know now that we had to go through because it was important for our awakening. What happened was, is we were both went from sleeping, from a sleeping position, 
to all of a sudden, without knowing how we got there, from lying down and sleeping to sat up in bed. I was looking at Mick. Mick was screaming hysterically, um, as if he was being attacked. Um, it was horrendous, and I was trying to calm him down. I was shouting him, saying, what's the matter, what's the matter, you know, you know what can I do? And he was just looking straight through me as if I wasn't there. I could see that, you know, there was, there was nothing there, there was no one home, but, you know, the, the body was going through the motions, but there was nothing going on here. And, um, you know, I was terrified, didn't know what to do, I'm trying to calm him down, nothing's happening. And then the next thing I thought, well, I'll try and scream for my mum. So I started trying to scream for my mum, and nothing was coming out. It was like I was being stifled, like somebody got me around the throat. And, uh, you know, I just, I just didn't know what, what was happening, and, you know, I'm so scared that I wasn't even able to cry. It was just, you know, scared stiff, literally. As I started trying to scream for my mum, Mick all of a sudden came around and went, what? What's the matter? What's the matter? Um, and I was like, well, you're screaming, you know, what's the matter really? I'm trying to calm you down, you look like you've been attacked. And he said, I haven't been screaming. She, you've been screaming, I've been trying to calm you down. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I'm adamant, no, no, it's, you've been doing the screaming. I've been trying to calm you down. And he's, no, no, it's definitely the right. Well, we were absolutely terrified at this point, we were petrified. <laughs> you know, it's not the kind of thing that happens every day. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was terrifying to say the least. We realised um, later on what was happening to us, and I'll get on to that. But it seemed that this was taking place on some other dimension for one or both of us because, uh, you know, how do you explain that? You know, if it's happening to me, if it's not happening to Mick, or and vice versa, in the same time, in the same space. Uh, something, you know, quite, uh, quite unusual, <laughs> really. So we got up. Um, we just started getting into the spiritual stuff, you know, we'd learned about angels and things like that, and how to call for protection and making sure you've got good energies around you. So we started calling for all the, you know, all the, uh, you know, the angels and different things. We got up and we sat and waited for um, parents to get up, um, but, you know, it seemed such a long time. We were so scared that we couldn't even go to the toilet without one another by our side. Uh, it's funny now, but at the time it wasn't, it was really, uh, it was quite, quite traumatic. But, um, and, and this, uh, this went on, and uh, eventually everybody got up, we explained what had gone on. It was like, you know, we need to get this medium here as soon as, because we can't, whatever's, you know, whatever's just happened, we can't have that happening again, it's terrible. And um, my sister came around, my older sister, um, shortly afterwards when everybody was up ready for work, she was just around the corner. And uh, as Mick was explaining to her what he'd experienced the night before, where he actually, sorry, I missed that minute, he felt as if he was being possessed. He felt like, uh, on the night before we left, Mick actually felt something come over him and possess him. But he felt that he was fighting it off and he was trying hard not to let it take full control of him. And I could see that, I could see what was happening to him, and that's why I realised, even though he was being snappy with me and, and you know, quite verbally aggressive, I realised it wasn't him. Um, that's obviously when we, you know, we made that decision, we need to get this sorted now. But as he was explaining that to my sister, she started to take on the same symptoms. She started to feel tunnel vision like Mick had done. She started to feel pins and needles, and she felt like she was, you know, being taken over. So she quickly grabbed her car keys, got off and left, <laughs> and we didn't see her again for a couple of days. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was. I don't think she wanted to speak to us after that. Uh, and then, uh, and then we got. We were just about to go and pick the medium up. We didn't live too far away, but she she texted to say. I oh, can't make it today, um, I'll give you a reading tomorrow for free if you like. And <laughs> it was like at that point, you know, pure desperation. It was like, no, that, that won't do. You've said you're coming to help, we need you. Mm. We got on the phone to her and you know, convinced her that we needed her to come round. So we went and got her. And she was waiting on the, the doorstep. Um, and as she got in the car, you could see she looked very perturbed. It was like, you know, she said that to us that it's the first time she's ever been made to feel uncomfortable in her own home. Yet she's a professional medium, and she deals with this stuff all the time. But the uh, what would happen? What was happening to her was that she said that her um, her washing machine, which wasn't on, lifted off the ground in the kitchen. A coffee cup that she made had been moved and was being moved around the house, and there was all these kinds of things happening to her as if trying to put her off coming to help us. Uh, but it didn't work. You know, we managed to get her and um, we brought her to her house. Um, what she told us was that uh, Sarah Jensen, um, we were all standing there, she said, Sarah Jensen just walked in. She's telling me that um, she's been murdered. 
basically. She was murdered by her stepdad, and um, John Berkshire, his name was. He um, had been abusing her for a long time. And on this particular night, at around 20 past, half past three in the morning, uh, 159 years ago, in the year 1850, he'd come into her bedroom, he had uh, smothered her, he'd taken the abuse a step further, I think we all know what that means, and um, as she started trying to scream out for her mum, he smothered her, put his hand over her mouth, and uh, he didn't mean to apparently, but <clears throat> he, um, he, he suffocated her. And all this uh, that, that had taken place 159 years ago, uh, she confirmed to us that what had happened to us that morning in the early hours, we were reliving her final moments, we were reliving Sarah Jensen's death, her murder. Um, hence the flowers the night before, because it was coming up to the anniversary. Um, hence me trying to scream out for my mum, but feeling stifled, there was nothing coming out, she'd been smothered. One of the other things that we did is we left a light on in the bedroom, which, not out of fear, but for some reason we just didn't think to turn it off that night. Um, because Sarah Jensen saw everything that was coming. Uh, the room was illuminated and you know she, she knew what was what was what was gonna happen. Um, and then she confirmed to us that we've got John Berkshire, Sarah Jensen's murderer around her, around us. And then he'd been causing a lot of problems. Um, negative energies like that can you know they'll try and break things up, they will try and cause problems between people and that's what was happening between me and Mick. You know, things were bad enough at work for us, you know, we were very negative because of the situations we were in at work. And all this taking place as well, not really knowing anything about negative energies or what, it, what it's capable of. You know, we've got all this going on as well. Um, and there were things trying to split us up. We, we were aware of that now. We look back at some of the silly arguments, the petty things that used to happen between us, and we think, where did that come from? We know now that we've been sort of, um, you know, prompted into, you know, um, arguing with each other over nothing, really. Um, and uh, generally, you know, that feeling of... Uh, uh, not not very much well-being. Um, um, so what happened was um, the the medium um, helped Sarah Jensen. She spoke to her and told her, you know, about the light. It, she needs to go into the light. And um, and the same with John Berkshire. Eventually, she managed to convince Sarah to go. Uh, but she was frightened at first because she thought she was going back to the family that had harmed her. Apparently, her mother used to stand by and do nothing and let all this abuse happen and uh, did nothing about it, so she didn't want to go back to her mum because she felt that everything would be the same when she went through the light. Uh, but it was explained to her that things aren't quite the same um, on the other side when people have gone through. So eventually she went. Before she went, she told um, us to, that uh, pink and lilac were her favourite colours. They didn't mean anything at the time. Um, but basically we started to see a lot of pink and lilacs later on. Um, and John Berkshire gave her a little bit more of a problem, but eventually he went into the light. And um, we hear now that uh, um, at the time he'd gone through some counselling and stuff. And he, I think you kind of become your own judge at that point, and you have to face what you've done in life. And you know he had to face up to what he'd done, and it wasn't the first time he'd done it. <laughs> so uh, there we go. Um, a bit of a ghost story, but. <coughs> It was um, really integral to our awakening um, because all this was going on. We just started to learn about energies, you know, Reiki energy and uh, angelic realms and, and different things. <coughs> and then all this sort of stuff started to happen to us at the same time. You know, um, there was no coincidence about the fact that it all happened around the same time. We'd, something had sparked in, in, in me and Mick when we got together. Um, there was there was all, there was like a trigger, you know, this awakening had started when we got together, and we had to go through all this together because it took us, uh, you know, quite a few months to sort of get over this because it was very traumatic at the time. But had we not been together, we may not have, you know, come out the right side of it. But thankfully, you know, we stuck together and we faced these problems head on. We had to face the fear as well because it was, you know, at one point we didn't want to go to bed at night, we used to get fearful when, when it started to go dark, we wanted to leave the lights on, but we thought, no, we've got to get this sorted, we've got to face it, and that's what we did, and we learned about what had happened to us, rather than um, run away from it, and so something had started for us, um, pink and lilac, uh, we started to find all kinds of pink and lilac things all around the house, and when we'd go out, there'd be sort of messages about uh, that all the names Sarah would pop up, and... Um, you know, we'd see people dressed in pink and lilac, which is not a usual combination of colours to see people in, I don't think. But we managed to see quite a few people wearing pink and lilacs. Um, this was an artificial flower. Um, we came in one day, 
and this was sitting in the uh, in the sink, in the kitchen sink, um, pink, pink and lilacish, and we, we've never had anything like that in the house, no one's ever brought anything like that in, it was not there before, where it came from, you know, physically we don't know, but spiritually we know it was a little sign to let us know that everything's okay now, um, you know, everything's, everybody's gone through to the other side and they're where they should be. So it was a, quite a bit of a roller coaster awakening really, quite a difficult one to start with. Um, but at that point, um, following that, once we got over this, you know, we were spirits breaking free, breaking free, and we started to realise that there was so much more to life, that uh, we weren't just born to work all our lives and then die, because that's what, you know, that's what a lot of people seem to do. Um, and we just felt, you know, if we're not happy with something, then we've got to change it. And we were really not happy with our jobs, as Mick explained. You know, things weren't right at work. Um, integrity was going down the pan with, you know, the organisation we were working for. And it was like, you know, when you want to change something, you're the one that's going to change it. You know, you have to take a stance and you have to do something about it. And we know that it's easier said than done. But we got to a point where we were almost, you know, forced to take action. And that's what happened. We, uh, you know, all this was going on. This awakening was occurring, and we decided, that's it. We've got to, we've got to leave this job, and we've got to change our lives. And um, that is what we did. I'm just going to pass you back to Nick. <coughs> planet Earth is a planet of free will. We we have the choice. We make the own choice in our own life. But it's the same when we die physically. We have a choice whether or not to stay in the mount in the earth plane or to go to where we should be to a vibrational compatible place. So Sarah Jensen, we'd actually really the murder and survived. With that comes research and a lot of a lot of searching. And we started to look into who was Sarah Jensen, who was John Berkshire, what were they doing in our house, what were they doing in our energy field? And basically we <coughs> looked into earthbound spirits. Now, the earthbound spirit is a spirit that we made in the body between the earth plane and the spirit world, usually referred to as ghosts. So in other words, they have chosen not to pass through to the light, they have chosen to stay on the earth plane. Now, earthbound spirits will have the same characteristics, the same personality and the same features, but when they were in physical form. That's why when people come through to speak to us, we can recognise them. There are many reasons for them not wanting to pass over. One, one of the reasons, as we said with Jensen, she refused to go until uh, justice had been done. She'd see the murderers unfinished business and she wouldn't go until people knew about it. Some, sometimes they don't even know they're dead. Sometimes they can actually be attached to material possessions and refuse to leave, such as houses, such as cars, and they, they refuse to leave. And they have the free will to do that. Now there is a window of opportunity for them to actually leave. And it is said that from the point of physical death, your light, your gateway to other realms, will be open for 80 hours. Now that is 80 hours from the final ceremony, which is widely regarded as the funeral. After that 80 hours, their light disappears. And if they suddenly have a change of heart, they have to go to another light source or another person that can actually help them to pass through. So they have 80 hours to do that. Now, spirit attachment, again, is what Sarah Jensen and her stepfather were. It's basically anything. It can be off planet, it can be a ghost, it can be former people that attach themselves to your energy field. And that is a spirit attachment. Now, spirit attachments, they have to have a food source. It's, it's basically everything's made of energy, and they have to have a food source, which is human emotion. And they generate human emotion by crashing your computer, making you angry, smashing windows, causing arguments, anything that, that can create a certain energy for them to feed off, they can do it. And because they vibrate at a very similar frequency to electricity, they can also interfere with your lights and, and everything else in order to generate a certain reaction in order to get the energy that they, they need. If they don't do that, they just wind down like a flat battery. So that's a spirit attachment. How you can recognise that is just obviously if things are going wrong, if, if all of a sudden you start feeling heavy and tired, you know, you've had a good night's sleep and you wake up the next morning tired, if you're aching, if you feel really heavy, if you're arguing with a loved one for no reason, uh, you, you know, you can't put your finger on why, you, why you're in a bad mood, you could well have a spirit attachment to ghost with you. And everybody which we go into in a moment will, will have spirit guides. Your spirit guides will know how to send a, a spirit through the light. 
So you just need to ask them and they will do it. If they don't have themselves, they will go and find out and come back and do it for you. But again, because it's free will, we need to give them permission to do it. So that is an earthbound spirit a ghost. Those who have chosen to remain in limbo, they have chosen to stay here in the earth plane. But what happens if they choose to actually pass through into the light? Okay, the light. I think um, everybody's heard of the light. Um, you know, programs such as the Ghost Whisperer and the film Ghost, you know, I think it's quite, uh, it's quite uh, popular. Um, but what happens is in our sort of um, experience, and from what we, when we've had these, these experiences, and then we've gone and done a bit of research as well, and the two seem to sort of match up. Um, we all vibrate at, at uh, you know, different frequencies, a different level of vibration, um, and what seems to happen is when it's your time to go through the light, you will go to a place that is uh, vibrationally compatible to you, to a place where you're able to comfortably exist, you know, you're on a similar sort of frequency. Um, because if you didn't, it would be very uncomfortable, you wouldn't be able to exist there very easily. Um, and it would be like, uh, kind of, I suppose if you chucked a, a cube of ice into a fire, the two don't go together, you would get, you know, a bit of a reaction, uh, and one would melt, and <laughs> the other one would still be there. Um, but if you obviously put ice with ice, you know, that works. That's, that's what I'm trying to say, is that, you know, you kind of go somewhere that, that, that's a very similar frequency to yourself. <coughs> um, we came across a fantastic book called uh, Testimony, Testimony of Light. I don't know if anybody's ever read it. Um, if you have, it's a fan or if you haven't, sorry, it's a fantastic book. And um, it is a book that's um, a true um, account uh, based on um, the two friends who were, I think, uh, nuns. And they were studying uh, psychic phenomena and they were studying telepathy in particular and um, they uh, vowed that uh, at whatever point one of them passed over they would attempt to come back and contact the other to let them know what was going on wherever they were and what was taking place and, um, and this happened, they did it, uh, one of the ladies passed away um, from cancer I think it was and um, shortly after her death she managed to actually come back through to her friend and communicate to her what was going on, where she was and what was happening. She said that um, her death, her passing, um, was painless. The actual death part and the dying part was painless. You know, it was, the, uh, it was the problem that led her to her death that was the painful part. But the actual dying process, no problem, um, not a thing. And she said that she literally woke up almost like from sleep on the other side. She woke up in this place that she described as a kind of, uh, like a rest home, uh, where she was nursed back to health. There was a few people there that she'd known in life that had obviously passed before her, uh, and other people that she didn't know, but she was helped um, and nursed back to health or to realise that she now didn't have these physical ailments that she had when she was alive. And um, she explained, um, she, she kept coming through, um, she, she, I think this went on for uh, several months, in our time anyway, and um, she explained that she was able to be put in touch with people that were still living, you know, through a medium, to, let, to give messages to people that she was okay, and those that had passed before her, so, so just family members, she was been, she'd been put in contact with, they were able to come back together where they were and share time together before carrying on and doing what they were there to do. She, uh, she stayed around this rest home place for a little while because she wanted to help um, the new arrivals, as she called them. Uh, she wanted to help them come to terms with the fact that they'd now passed over as well. Um, she saw that as her role for quite a while. And it's a really, really interesting story. Um, she explained about the vibrations. Um, this is something that we kind of picked up on ourselves and then finding this book confirmed a lot for us. She explained how you, know, you have to be vibrationally compatible. Not everybody goes, uh, you know, to exactly the same place where well, you can still come back together. It's not like you're separated because everything is connected anyway. Uh, but they can come and go. Um, and uh, she come face to face with light beings. Um, she just described as beings of light, angels, um, and other um, higher dimensional beings that were there to help her and other people to uh, sort of carry on and progress with their soul journey. Uh, because every every single one of us is on a, a journey, we're on this soul journey to learn um, as much as we can, 
to develop as a soul and uh, to carry on and progressing. And, um, and this is what, what was happening to her. She explained how um, on occasion she was taken to um, meet her soul group, a group of people that were uh, very similar to her in, in their interests, in their backgrounds, and um, she was able to sort of go and visit them. But she wouldn't be able to stay around them for too long at first because of the vibrational difference. They had sort of carry on, carried on progressing <coughs> higher and higher, and so therefore their vibrations were quite a, you know, quite a way apart. So she had to sort of work to get herself up to that level so she could stay around them for longer periods of time. And that's what she did. And the soul group um, is like, it was described as being a family, a very, very tight-knit family, where um, certain members of the soul group will go off, they will incarnate in different places, some on earth, some not. And they will uh, aim to learn as much as they can wherever they go. And then the idea was to come back and all that information, all that experience is put into a pot you know, and uh, they all learn and grow from it together, and they all progress together. And uh, she described how there were uh, soul groups of scientists, and who would incarnate when they incarnate physically, would obviously be attracted to science and um, and things like that, and they would be happy to sort of acknowledge for it. And um, there were um, the groups of dancers, groups of artists. They all tended to hang around in the same sort of groups with similar interests. Um, Eventually, uh, the communications with her stopped, um, and it's believed that, that she basically had, had progressed to such a level, you know, such a high vibrational level, that it was almost impossible to sort of come through anymore. Um, but the journey continued, um, you know, it doesn't stop. I know most people in this room are very aware that there's a lot more to reality than what we can see in front of us, so we don't really need to go there, but, um, you know, so many people don't, so many people don't realise that this, you know, this is it, that there's so much more. Um, which is a shame because you know there is so much more. You know we've experienced it, and I, you know again most people in this room have had their experiences, no doubt. Um, and you know we can all learn and grow from that. And that's exactly what happens. Um, we've had an experience with the light ourselves. Um, we uh, one night last year, October two thousand and ten, uh, and we does anybody know Sutton Park? Yeah, Sutton Park. Okay, we go there quite regularly. We we meet up with a friend. Because we've become sort of sensitive to this stuff now, we kind of pick up when there's things around us and lost souls and spirits and other beings. We like to sort of go out um, to these places and see what we can pick up. Um, our friend brings a camera and um, takes a lot of pictures and, and some of the pictures we get are really amazing. Um, but this particular night, we, uh, we were walking through, we were doing what we normally do, we were starting to feel that there was quite a backlog of you know, spirit behind us. Uh, which we, at the end of the night we would normally sort of ask for those to be cleared and sent on to wherever they needed to be sent on to and have our energies cleared. But at this point we were walking through the middle of the park and it was pitch black. Um, there was no one <laughs> around. Um, we could feel all this soul, we could feel all this energy building up. And I didn't realise till later on Mick and, and our friend Jeff had actually asked in their head for the Archangel Michael to come and clear some of the energies because it was getting very heavy, very dense. Uh, and all of a sudden in front of us, um, through the trees, came from the top of the trees, came this massive white light, it was like a beam. It hit the road in front of us and then it opened out and stayed there for about 20 or 30 seconds. And us not realising straight away what was going on, we were, you know, a little bit, um, I won't say that we ran, <laughs> but we did. Um, we ran, we ran to the end of the bar. <laughs> we ran, we did. It, it was a bit scary at the time, but then we realised what was going on. And Mick and Jeff had explained that they called call for assistance in clearing these uh, these beings, these spirits, these souls. And this light had come and opened up in front of us and was actually, um, you know, doing its thing. I had uh, a camera phone with me, which I wasn't aiming at it, uh, well, I didn't think it was, but all of a sudden that went off on its own and took the picture that you can see on the, on the right hand side. And it seemed to capture, I mean, obviously it's caught the light, but it. Uh, the picture itself on the phone is a lot clearer, but there's lots of orbs and different things that seem to be going into this light and all these different beautiful colours. Uh, it was amazing. When we looked at some of the other pictures we caught earlier on in the night, as you can see top left, um, this picture was um, behind Mick. We'd taken a picture of Mick, and then this light, this sort of well, what seems to be some kind of gateway opening, was you know to his to his left. And this appeared on a few, uh, about two pictures, I think. 
And then shortly afterwards, this is when the, the big light hit the road and opened up in front of us. Um, so that was, uh, again, it was amazing to sort of experience that. And it, again, it was confirmation for us that what we were learning, what we were experiencing, the fact that we were asking for this assistance, this help, and actually getting it, and you know, being able to physically see it with our eyes, um, was just a brilliant confirmation that you know, we're not all mad, and that you know, when you're asking for something, it is actually happening. You know, there is stuff going on around us energetically. We might not be always able to see it, but um, when you put your trust in it and your faith, you know that it's there, and uh, this just confirmed that for us. So, yeah, moving on from the light. Astral projection, um, I'll just quickly read this. Astral projection or astral travel is an interpretation of out-of-body experience, OBE, that assumes the existence of an astral body separate from the physical body and capable of travelling outside of it. Astral projection or travel denotes the astral body leaving the physical body to travel in the astral plane. Has anyone ever had an out of body experience? Yeah, well, quite a few people, and that's, that's, uh, that's interesting. Um, I've had some out of body experiences, but again, it's something that started off really quite terrifying for me because at the age of 13, um, one uh, night, I suddenly woke up in bed absolutely frozen. Uh, I don't mean cold, I mean frozen stiff, I couldn't move. Um, my consciousness was still awake and I was screaming, well, I was trying to scream for help because my, my physical body was not doing anything, it was, it was asleep, it was frozen and uh, it was terrifying and at the time I could feel that there was lots of stuff going on around me as well that you know, I couldn't see with my eyes and um, it, it's a really terrifying experience for anybody that's had it, it's known as sleep paralysis and um, it's, uh, it's terrifying because you are, your consciousness is, is, is awake, you, you know, you are, you, you're, the real you is absolutely 100% awake, but your body is fast asleep, it's, uh, you know, you're kind of caught between the two, and you try and scream, you try and struggle against it, and nothing happens, and the more you try and struggle against it, the scarier and ter more terrifying it gets. Um, and this happened, this started, it just suddenly started for some reason. I mean, sleep paralysis is something that we all go through, it's just that we're you know, our consciousness is also asleep normally at the time that happens, so we don't experience that in between state. Uh, but when it does happen, when you're caught in between, it's, it's, uh, it's very scary. Um, but what I learned was, um, over the years, um, this kept going on, that something was happening to me, it was a transition state, um, and a couple of years ago, um, this happened to me, and I got so fed up of struggling and fighting against it and, you know, trying to scream out, I just thought, well, Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. I'll just go with it and see what happens. And that's what I did. And uh, at the time, we were actually at a sleepover with some friends. We were on the floor downstairs. And um, I stopped struggling and I lay there. And all of a sudden, I sat up thinking that I'd sat up physically. And I turned around and my body was still asleep on the floor. And uh, I was like, well, this is, this is something new. <laughs> I haven't experienced this before. Um, and it was, again, it was amazing. And I tried to lean over to Mick, who was fast asleep, and I was trying to say to him, you know, make me wake up, look, look. But I realised then that he wouldn't have seen me because I didn't like a ghost to him at that point. Um, so, and then the next thing I know is all of a sudden I've been sort of sucked back into my body, and, uh, and that was it. And all of a sudden I could move, I was awake physically, I couldn't believe what had happened. But then I realised, so this is what it's all about, this is what this sleep paralysis all these years has been about for me anyway. It's been about getting to that transition point and now being able to exist outside of the physical body. Again, um, you know, this is proof to me personally that this is not it, you know, this is just part of it. There's so much more to us than this physical body and that we can exist outside of it. Uh, not only that, you know, there are those that are quite advanced in astral travel. Um, it's something that was widely practiced amongst the ancients. They were able to get to a point where they could travel off, uh, travel the universe, go to other planets, meet up with different beings, different realms of existence, higher planes. Uh, and again, they would use it to, um, you know, further their knowledge, um, gain experience outside of themselves, and then bring that back to the waking state, to their physical lives. Um, it's something that everybody's capable of. Why, why it suddenly happened to me, I really don't know. I wasn't asking for it, I wasn't looking for it, and I certainly wasn't expecting it. Uh, but it happened. Um, but again, as I say, it's amazing to realise that you can exist outside the physical body, that this, this isn't it, this really isn't it. Um, and then, sorry, just <laughs> come, come back on. Oh, I 
can you know that's fine um, and yes obviously as you as you travel and learn to sort of negotiate the astral planes and the other levels you do come face to face with other beings um, there are the angelic realm and uh, uh, other beings of higher existence that are there to teach us you know people do see their spirit guides and um, you know, I can recall being in classrooms and being sat around to learn stuff and bringing that back to their physical lives and then applying it. Um, and I'm going to pass you back over. I've actually seen Sarah a couple of times uh, coming back to her body and the one time she was actually next to me reading a book. So, you know, it does happen and that was confirmation for her as well. And the only difference between physical death and astral travel is an effort cord keeps you attached to your physical body. At the point of physical death, that cord is severed, and then you can never return. But your spirit will travel and do what it needs to do. So now we come to the angels. Basically, angels are not a race. It is a name. It means messengers, and they are beings from the higher realms of existence because every being is a different, different vibrational level. Humanity and planet Earth is a third dimension. That's why we vibrate very slow. The angel was a higher, higher vibration. And there are many of them. So some of them, some of the archangels are actually uh, eleventh dimensional Batal, who are responsible for the universe and for all the wormholes and, and dimensional gates. And many of the archangels are actually the, the extraterrestrial race called the Batal. But there's many of them. That there are normal, just normal angels that will concentrate on one thing, but they'll be very good at that one thing. An example is your everybody would have guardian angels. But your guardian angel will be a fantastic uh, protector. <coughs> there will be healing angels who will deal with healing and so on. But they can actually progress through service to others to become archangels. Now archangels are the overseers, almost like the you know the sergeants and inspectors and, and, and supervisors. And there are many of them, but they all have different roles. You have Archangel Raphael, whose female counterpart is Mother Mary, the biblical Mother Mary, and they are the healing. That they then in charge of healing. You have Archangel Michael, who is the head of the Blue Lightning Angels, who are the warrior protectors. You have Archangel Uriel, who is the head of the, the Ruby Ray Angels, who are the, the warrior angels that get sent in against any dark forces, uh, fearless warriors, and so on. There are many different things. Uh, each angel will have its own specification. We've had many experiences with them ourselves. These are our guardian angels that were drawn for us by a spiritual artist, and we can confirm that you know, it wasn't Evans only, we've actually seen them ourselves, so he, he was telling us the truth. The one on the left is Makara, who is, who is my guardian angel, and Corey on the right is Sarah's guardian angel. They will be assigned to you at the point of physical birth, and they will stop by your side until the point of physical death. In some cases, they can actually intervene with. If you're in a dangerous situation, they can actually intervene, and many people have had their lives saved by their guardian angels. But primarily, they are actually soul protectors. So when they leave our body and we go travelling the astral planes and wherever, your guardian angel will be a soul protector to ensure that you get back safely. And those are ours. And they actually, they're actually from Atlantis. We were actually, when we have previous lives, one being in Atlantis, and these two are Atlantean guardian angels. This is an actual picture that we took in Sutton Park and it's Archangel Michael. And if you can see on the picture, there's lots and lots of little orbs around the figure there. Those, I would say, are probably lost souls because Archangel Michael takes lost souls through the light to where they should be. That's, that's one of his responsibilities, one of many. And on that evening, we actually called him in. And when you zoom into the photo, you can actually see his blue aura because cobalt blue is Archangel Michael's color. And he's actually here tonight because I've seen a couple of flashes with him in this room, so it actually was this evening in the room. So that's Archangel Michael. So if anybody ever feels scared or something goes bump in the night, he's a seven foot, eight foot warrior angel, and he's a, he's a fantastic protector. So if you ever get scared, he's the one to call. If you ever need confidence, he's the one to call. Uh, he's a parent and saint of police officers, and he also is a, he's a guardian of children. So there's a connection there. So that's, that's the angels, basically the higher, higher level of beings. Then we have what's called the spiritual masters, and many of them have actually declined their life of passage to the higher realms to stop and have a hands-on approach to help planet Earth and humanity. Some of them are quite quite famous. Uh, Saint Germain, who in a previous life was Merlin. Also in another previous life was Fra Francis Bacon, who actually helped William Shakespeare with his place. And a lot of his 
private thoughts were actually put into the public arena through the workings of Shakespeare. Uh, Francis Bacon was actually the, the son of the Virgin Queen, so quite obviously they got a name slightly wrong. And basically, he, he was, he was, his rightful place was on the front of England, and his private thought was, shall I keep quiet, or shall I tell people about it? And that was where it was Shakespeare to be or not to be. It was Francis Bacon influencing William Shakespeare to write his private thoughts. We also have Kwan Yin, we have Mother Mary, and who we know as Jesus Christ, who is actually a cosmic being named Sananda. He's, a, he's a, an ascending master who, again, has lots of influence on the earth and came down here 2,000 years ago to try and get us to do things better than, than we do. And we all know what happened. So those are the spiritual masters, you know, they, they've actually took themselves out of infinity, out of eternity, and have decided to come back to the concepts of time, just to help humanity. Many of them have actually incarnated into physical bodies to address the balance of what's going on, because, as we will get to later, you know, that there are dark and light, and the darkness has overstepped the mark. It's, it's got too, too far into its role, and a lot of the ascended masters have actually decided to incarnate into physical bodies to address the balance. Again, moving on, again, the, the, the same thing. Uh, we all have spirit guides. Some of us can have hundreds of them, depending. Uh, my spirit guides consist of family members who have passed off planet. We, we have guides from Sirius and, and the Pleiades. And, and everybody has spirit guides, and they're basically here to help us and give us ideas and, and to help us. We can even ask for part time spirit guides. So if we're actually going through a certain course or a certain exam or whatever, we can ask for probably spirit guides who have done that course, who have done that exam, to come and help us, and they will be assigned to us to help us. Is that cheating? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how bad you want it. They've got that cheating in my school. <laughs> Not many, but, yeah. but, but if you want to pass the exam, you can actually ask for them to come and help you, and they will come and help you. If there's something they don't know personally, they will go away and find out and come back. So sometimes when you have thoughts put into your head, or ideas put into your head, and you think that's a good idea, a lot of the times come from the spirit guides because, because our minds are so jam-packed all the time, you know, a lot of these messages are not getting through to us. That's why a, a lot of the time they will come to you in dreams or just as you go to sleep or just as you're waking up because that's when your mind is its most quietest, most calm and that's when these messages can come through. So basically we all have spirit guides, we all have angels, we all, we all have guardian angels and we all have spiritual masters, anybody on a spiritual path will have spiritual masters with them. So that's that. So that concludes the first part of the talk. I'll have a quick break. After the break we'll talk about the spiritual side of extraterrestrials and UFOs and Atlantis and the pyramids. And we'll put it all into what it's really all about. Thank you very much. Twenty minutes, and that may feel like ten. So start moving. Twenty minutes, try and be back. Yeah. Okay, everybody. We um, try and uh, break up. I know part of such sorrow. Like Richard Baker. Uh, Francis Baker. <laughs> Fred Bacon, yeah, Danish, Danish Bacon. <laughs> Come on, everybody. Um, before we just get underway, we are going to ask, well, Kerry wants to just announce the um, uh, four eye action, action, group. action group, which is um, starting to gain a bit more momentum. We had Joy Warren here a few weeks ago, or a few months ago, doing about fluoride in the water and the fact that Birmingham suffers quite badly with it, so I'm going to leave you with Kerry, yeah. and uh, welcome to Occupy Bilsley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, just to, to let you know, it's our second action meeting, so it's not an educational group. We're hoping that you're going to come to the group with an existing idea of fluoride and what it does and why it's not great to have it in the water and come to the group ready to actually start doing something to get it removed from the water. That's be, be our second meeting. The first meeting I was really pleasantly surprised with the turnout and everyone went away, you know, enthused and with their ideas, um, ready to bring something back this, this month. So it's going to be on the 20th of this month um, at one o'clock 
at the Prince of Wales in, in Moseley. So if you can make it and you've got some time spare to dedicate to the cause and to help us campaign to get fluoride removed from our tap water, really love to see you there. Thank you. <laughs> Sunday at 1 o'clock. Not 12, not 12. <laughs> well, thank you for all coming back and not going on. But this part of the talk is still on the spiritual theme, but it covers extraterrestrials and their history with us and we being a part of them, etc. etc. It is still a sound spiritual theme, but there are multiple agendas as there is with anything. And there's also multiple agendas with extraterrestrials, which we're going to go through now. So, a little brief history. Many, many thousands of years ago, a group of extraterrestrials called the Anunnaki came from their respective planet Nibiru to mine for gold on Earth. Anunnaki just means those who from heaven to Earth came, and they came here to mine for gold because there, their planet, the atmosphere on their planet was dwindling, and they found that if they ground up gold, would be sort of past their house on there, so to speak. So they came to Earth and they found Homo sapiens man and they basically manipulated the human DNA to make us a slave race. But we got too smart and because they were fantastic geneticists they did a good job and we got too smart for them. So they actually de deactivated the human DNA which science calls junk DNA. Well it's not junk, it's basically ours, it's just been deactivated because we were getting too smart. So they came here and, and mined for gold. Many of them were from Alpha Draconis and many of them were of reptilian appearance. Now we're not David Icke and I know he gets, gets laughed at for, for mentioning reptilians but there is an extraterrestrial race called the Alpha Draconis who are of reptilian appearance. And even though they don't look reptilian, it was actually forbidden, uh, punishable by death, almost, to be represented how they actually looked. They wanted to be represented how they wanted to be represented. Now Enki is basically known as the fish god. Now the first sign of Christianity is of course the fish, which is where that came from. If you look at the Pope and his ceremonial hat, it's shaped like a fish. That basically comes from the fish god Enki. Now Enlil, who was his brother, is known sort of it with many different names. Some people call him Yui, some people call him Jehovah. He's basically an extraterrestrial being from the Alpha Draconis. <coughs> so they came here and, and mined for gold. They passed on a, a, a sort of a lot of knowledge to, to humankind. If you look at the picture bottom left, you will see the sun and all the planets of the solar system. That tablet is 4,000 years old. We didn't realise that we had the sun and those planets until 300 years ago. So this knowledge was actually passed down from people who knew the layouts of, of our solar system. And that was the Anunnaki. And basically they came here, they had a mind for that gold. And even the Bible says there were giants in those days. There were many, many people walking around. Even a group of beings called Nephilim, who were a mixture of human and fallen angel DNA. The left hand picture is basically a, a female bone of, of a being that would have been 14 to 16 feet tall. Now many of the, the YouTube pictures are actually fake but the bones that have been recovered are actually real and some of the Nephilim actually reached 30 odd feet, 30 odd feet tall. There's also an extraterrestrial group, the most famous group called the Greys, who are part of the Orion group. Now in 1954 at the Holloman US Air Force Base, President Eisenhower actually signed a treaty with the Greys. That treaty was technology for residents on Earth and also for human abduction and human experimentation. <coughs> because the Greys, a lot of them are actually remote controlled, but they can't get a soul to actually incarnate their body. So they are trying to find the secret of the soul to re, sort of recreate it, to make sure their race actually survives because their race is a dying race. They are subservient to the reptilians and they work work together, but the, the Greys actually want to use us to sort of get rid of their, their slavery to. The Alpha Draconis were the first to actually achieve off-planet travel and how they used to do that was by hollowing out planets and asteroids and using kinetic, 
kinetic energy to actually put them through the universe. Our moon is such an example. And it is actually a hollow spaceship which was brought to our system from Ursa Minor about 11,000 years ago. The one in the middle is the Star Wars Death Star. And if anybody's ever seen the film Star Wars, the Death Star is exactly what I'm basically races of beings like Darth Vader and his stormtroopers travel the universe and take out the planets using the Death Star. The moon is exactly the same thing. Now when the moon was put into the position it is, it caused the Earth's axis to tilt. And when the Earth's axis tilted, it caused what they called the Great Deluge, what we know as the Biblical Flood, because the Earth had been tilted because of the gravitational pull of the moon. The moon shouldn't be there, and even scientists now are starting to say the best thing we can say about the moon is it shouldn't be there. So that, that's why it was actually brought in by the Alpha Tricarnis as a, as a, as a space, spacecraft. Now Noah was actually the son of Enki, and he was tipped off to what was going to happen, hence the reason he actually built his ark. Now Noah's ark was actually a submarine. And even though the Bible tells us that the, the animals went to two by two, it was actually the DNA of the animals, as I say, because because this group of beings were extra, you know, extraterrestrial and fantastic geneticists, they were quite easily able to recreate the animals after. When they landed, they actually landed in the modern day Iraq, uh, which they knew then as Sumer, and they landed in a place they called Eridu, which is the home of a faraway place. And what they used to do is they, they used to build little domes of green houses, and they used to call them Garden of Edens, because it used to be their habitat, their vegetation their sort of atmosphere from where they came from and that's where the biblical garden of eden actually comes from the garden of eden and we can see these structures on the moon still and also on mars these extraterrestrials actually travel the universe and bring various species to various planets earth being one of them to see if they can actually survive now the dinosaurs were actually brought in in full form by these extraterrestrials, and so were the monkey race. They were brought here to see if they could actually survive. The reptilians have a free caste system, which is royalty, officer class, and worker class. Now, we have a very similar system ourselves, and if you trace the name Elizabeth back to its origins, it actually comes from Lilith, who was the, the main reptilian gene carrier. Elizabeth, from its original origins, actually means L, lizard birth. There was not much interbreeding between these extraterrestrials and humans, which they called the demigods. And as a result of that came 13 royal reptilian bloodlines. And members of these bloodlines are forever put into positions of power to maintain a certain agenda. If you look at it, Number one on there is King John Plantagenet, who signed the Magna Carta in 1215. You have the Rockefellers, the family that pretty much own most of New York. You have the Rothschilds, who are actually behind the World Bank, and they own 50% of the world's wealth. That's the, the Rothschilds. Uh, we have the Kennedys, Hanovers, and of course, number eight is the Windsors, who are the British royal family. They are part of the reptilian royal bloodline, and therefore, they are put into positions of power. The picture you can see above the families are actual Sumerian carvings and they represent what the ancient person actually saw. Even though it was forbidden to represent them, some of them took the risk and some of them still did it. The, the main one was actually found in Iraq and it was at one point kept in the British Museum. I don't know if it's, if it's still there. But they all basically are representative of a reptilian race. <coughs> they leave us with many sort of signs of their history and their, and their power. If you look at the EU Parliament in Strasbourg, it looks remarkably like the Tower of Babel, which is where the, the human race started to have different languages to divide and conquer us. Many celebrations we still celebrate today come from Babylon. The Illuminati and such actually worshipped gods that actually were rulers of uh, Babel. But they needed a halfway point to shoot this gold because Earth to their planet in the building was too far. And the half, halfway out was to be the planet Mars. Now a splinter group of the Anunnaki called the Igigi 
set up a colony on Mars, which is called the Sardanian City. And on the Sardanian City, we have the Falls, which is a volcano. We have the Pentagon shape uh, sort of city, and we also have a face. Now, the face is of a deposed king of Nibiru called Alalu. He was one of the first to come down to Earth to mine for gold, and because there was sort of been fighting for power, he actually did did certain things that he shouldn't have done. And as a result of that, he was exiled to Mars, where he later died. And when his body was found on Mars, they actually carved his image into the rocks, and that was to become his tomb. And there we see the face on Mars. NASA will tell you that it's an optical illusion caused by the wind, but it's actually the tomb of the departed king of Nibiru. Not only do we have pyramids on Mars, but we also have pyramids here, and also on other planets which are in direct alignment with Orion's belt. Now the centre star of Orion's belt is actually one of 13 stargates in this universe, which is basically an open doorway from here to elsewhere. And the, the centre star is directly in alignment with the centre pyramid. Now we visited Egypt and, and we were actually shown what was really underneath, and there are dimensional gates which connect the pyramid, the Sphinx, to the centre star of Orion. It's almost a Fibonacci sort of sequence where everything comes back to the same point. But the Fibonacci sequence was only discovered 700 years ago. The pyramids are thousands upon thousands of years old. Their primary objective was what called an initiation of the left and right eye of Horus. Horus was an Egyptian god. It was basically sort of Christ-like ascension. And it was three stages. The first stage was called the Black Spiral, which is where people went in and actually manifested their fears and their negativity in order to face it and to deal with it. Many actually died at that stage. Those that actually passed through that stage went to the second stage in the king's chamber, which was to lie in the sarcophagus for three and a half days. And the sarcophagus was positioned in such a way that the sunlight went straight into the pineal gland of the subject. Now scientists will, will tell you, it is a known fact that just 20 minutes of sunlight each day will activate your third eye, activate your pineal gland. They were doing it for three and a half days. And also scientists have discovered that when the body is in such a deep meditation, it actually secretes a white powder. That white powder was found in the sarcophagus and is now kept at the British Museum. So it does exist. The third part of that sequence was the stabilisation room, the Queen's Chamber. That was the end of the sequence. And those that passed through all three sequences were basically had achieved an artificial ascension. So that was the main objective of the pyramids of Egypt. From, well, the pyramids of Egypt were actually built after the lost city of Atlantis actually fell and sank. Now, the, the dolphins are from Sirius, and there is a, a race of beings that the dolphin people are whale people, and what we know as mermaids who are from Sirius, and they are called the Namos, N L W M O S. It's a race of beings that come from an aquatic planet within the Sirian star system. The dolphins actually keep the ancient secrets and knowledge of the last city of Atlantis because that was considered basically an extraterrestrial colony where it was basically a holiday camp and everyone walks freely amongst themselves, angels, extraterrestrials, humans, they all, all walked amongst each other on Atlantis. And when Atlantis fell, the dolphins actually kept the secrets of it. Now we still see bits of Atlantis today, the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands are the only part of Atlantis that still remains above the surface. The Great Crystal of Atlantis, which was the powerhouse of the continent, when that sank to the bottom of the ocean, we now know that as the Bermuda Triangle because the Great Crystal was never deactivated. And when the sun and moon shine at certain positions on the seabed, it reactivates a crystal which causes an energy vortex, and that's when you get planes and ships disappearing. So the Bermuda Triangle is actually the Great Crystal of Atlantis that uh, was never deactivated. Extraterrestrials have left as many signs that they, they were here and they still are here. We have 22 strands of extraterrestrial DNA. We are part of them. Now the first one is, you see it on many Egyptian hieroglyphs, it's, it's a key. They call that the Ankh, which is basically the key of life, which, is, which shows the passing of knowledge, passing of the, the knowledge of eternity. And that's what he's doing. An extraterrestrial being is passed on the knowledge to a human being. It's called the anchor, the key of life. 
The middle one is actually sort of ancient cave drawings and obviously represented what the ancient cavemen actually saw. It can only be one thing. It's uh, an extraterrestrial being that they saw. The modern day evidence of visitation is of course the crop circles. Now this particular crop circle represents the Kundalini energy, which, which comes from the word Kundala, which means to roll, to spiral, because cosmic energy is always spiraled. And if you look at your fingertips, they're spiraled. If you look at the, the air clash, you see the scalp, it's in a spiral. If you look at Milky Ways and galaxies, they are in a spiral. That's because everything's made of cosmic energy, which is spiraled. Now, crop circles, there are many, many reasons for them. Some of them are obvious hoaxes, but the majority are not. This one represents the serpent energy, Kundalini energy, coming from the earth, wrapping around your spine, and activating each of your chakras as it goes past them, the Kundalini energy. Some of the crop circles are actually messages between extraterrestrial races, uh, the benevolent ones telling the benevolent ones to, to, to go. Some of them are flags of their nations, some of them are sacred geometry in the form of, of messages for us. When you go and stand inside a crop circle, you will feel a certain energy emitting from it, which actually connects with your subconscious and speaks to you. It's a fantastic thing. Uh, again, you can tell the ones that are, that are actually genuine because they are sort of nature friendly. One of the most famous ones is of course the hummingbird. Now the hummingbird was used because the hummingbird is the only bird in existence whose wings go into the figure of eight. Now the figure of eight means infinity. So what they were trying to tell us in that message was, we are all infinite, we are all infinity. So there's crop circles. Many of the gods of ancient times, especially the Egyptian gods, were actually extraterrestrial beings. But because they came down here in their celestial boats, or on cloud shaped things. They were seen as gods and worshipped because they had all this fantastic technology and all this universal knowledge. On this picture at the top left you have Apollo, underneath you have Zeus, and then you have the same character in Greek and, uh, and Roman, which is Poseidon and Neptune. They are all extraterrestrial gods and they're all worshipped, many of them in Egypt. Even during the war, extraterrestrials had an influence there was a, a renegade group of Palladians called the Giza Intelligence who actually gave the Nazi scientists rockets and UFO technology and those two were actual pictures taken from the Second World War. After the war had ended, the Americans pretty much stole the Nazi scientists because of their advanced knowledge. Those scientists became NASA. NASA is actually the German scientists from World War II, the CIA and the NSA. And when you see American troops guarding the opium fields in Afghanistan. That's who's putting the drugs on the streets. It's the CIA to fund black ops. That's, that's what they're doing. <coughs> so they, they all form NASA. There are, of course, many benevolent beings that have agreed to help us. Many of them wouldn't. Many of them refused on the basis of, and they actually said in galactic councils, they don't respect themselves, they don't respect each other, they don't respect their planet, what is their worth? And as a result of that, Many actually refused to help humanity, but many of them did. And these are the main five. Starting from the left, you have the Palladians. Underneath with the funny shaped head, you have the Syrian A's. In the middle, you have the Teresatians. The top there, you have the Arcturians. And then at the bottom, you have the, the Andromedans. Many of them are actually human races that scattered all over the universe after the Lyran Wars between humans and the Arthrochromis and we ended up in all different places, including planet Earth. They do, believe it or not, actually marvellous. They do really, really respect humanity because we have 22 of their DNA strands. They marvel the fact that we can make music because they can't. Uh, they have to basically record the music and sound from individual planets to listen to music. They cannot make music and they wonder why, why we can. They get very confused as to how Humanity can in one second be calm and polite, and then within the space of seconds they can be so angry to kill somebody. They can't understand how we can be full of so many emotions. And they also ask us a question, which I've never been able to answer, and neither has anybody else. And that question is, why do you pay to live on the planet you were born on? <laughs> we, we are the only species on this planet that pays to be here, and we are the only 
place in this universe that we have to pay to live on the planet that we were rightfully born on. We have to buy our water, we have to buy our food. We're that even charges now for, the, for the, the energy from the sun. Why are we paying to live on the planet we were born on? That is the question they can't, they can't fathom. But they are here to help us, and, and many of them have actually agreed to tutor us. Many, even some, some of the people in this room will be what's called star seeds, basically come down from, from other planets to incarnate into a human body. And many of the uh, Native American Indians were star seeds from Sirius, who came here to teach us about harmony with the land. And most importantly, when we take something, we have to give something back. It's, it's, it's basic universal balance. If you take, you must give back to, to balance it. And they came here as a, as a peace, sort of peace loving race to, to help us. Many of them actually come here but disguise themselves. And you may say that's not a very good disguise, but they, they are here. You know, we, we've seen many of them, but by actually channel messages from them. They are with us, you know, both good and bad, they are here. The Coalition of Star Nations who have agreed to help us for, for various reasons are called the Galactic Federation of Light. And the head of the Galactic Federation of Light is a Commander Ashtar who operates from his, his light ship, the Pegasus. He also works closely with Jesus Christ, who, who they call Sananda, and, and all of them together <coughs> are actually here to help humanity to rise to a higher vibration. That's what they're here for. So, we've now discussed the two different agendas of why they're here, but we've also had many experiences ourselves, and I was passionate on the server just to describe a few of them. Yeah, we've had many experiences. We've seen a number of craft. We've seen all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, and many of them actually while we were on duty as police officers. Um, just quickly to run through those pictures on the screen. Pictures number one and three were taken by men, um, both whilst on duty. Um, <coughs> here, um, here's a picture that we found that represents exactly what myself and Mick saw one day in the Tamworth area. Um, we were basically driving around um, pure daylight, pure sunlight, like, like that picture there. And these things were literally just um, completely stationary, uh, three of them in the sky, uh, not too far away from the snow dome. Um, and it was really weird because there were lots of people around, but nobody seemed to see them. Um, but it's not as if you could miss them um, if they were on the same sort of plane that we are on at the moment. Uh, they were right there, um, you know, plain as day. Um, we didn't get a very good vibe from these ones because they were very, there was a very eerie feeling to them. Uh, and as Mick says, there are different genders, there's different things going on. Not all UFOs are from a galaxy far, far away. Some of them are from a lot closer to home. Um, number one, um, one night again on duty. Um, this picture actually turned out completely different to what we'd actually seen with our physical eyes. What we'd seen with our physical eyes uh, was a, a very um, rounded sh um, ship like a spherical shape, um, bright orange, and it, uh, it definitely wasn't a Chinese lantern because this thing came around twice, it did a circuit and stopped stationary, I don't think Chinese lanterns tend to do that. Um, and uh, it first of all appeared like a, a plane on fire, but then it became apparent that it wasn't a plane and that it wasn't anything conventional that we know of um, because of the manoeuvres it was making, the, you know, the stationary um, elements to it. Uh, and then the picture was taken, and, it, and that's the shape that came out from something that was a perfect sphere. They've got something that's you know, quite triangular when you look at the top of it, and then it's got this kind of tail coming from it. Um, so why that is, I don't know. Likewise with picture three, um, this um, was again on duty. This just looked like um, a star, um, but it was a star that uh, was stopping and starting in the sky. Uh, took a picture of it and that's what came out. Um, we've seen several of those since and uh, you know, there's seemed to be quite a lot of these things around. Um, now, as we said earlier, everything has its own vibration. Everything operates on its own frequency. What happens with a lot of UFOs is um, people often report seeing them just disappear. One minute they're there, next minute they've just gone, disappeared. Um, what what tends to happen with them is they are um, 
they're very aware of the vibrational thing. They're able to operate and, uh, and use that. And they will speed up their vibrations to such a point where we can no longer see them. They go beyond our physical sight. So one minute they will appear to be there. The next second, you know, they up the, uh, up the vibrations and they've disappeared from human sight. Sometimes those, uh, that fails. I mean, a lot of these things try and cloak themselves. Sometimes that doesn't always work. You know, you've got people that are in tune uh, and do actually see these things. And sometimes their cloaking devices, you know, fail and, and we get to see these things. Um, and sometimes, you know, they deliberately want to be seen. Um, there's different different things going on. As we say, we've got these, um, who Mick have talked about, we've got these entities, uh, Federation of Light and, and various others, that, that actually are here to help us and they do appear to us at times. Uh, not to uh, appear as saviours or anything like that, but just to let us know that we're not alone um, and that there's more to, to life than what we realise. Um, but then there are other um, craft have other beings on, um, that are not quite, their intentions aren't quite so pure. Um, and basically we're going to move on to a little bit of stuff in a minute about the Illuminati and the secret uh, government and uh, you know the different agendas that are at play. A lot of this stuff is being used at the moment. We are being sort of built up for some kind of UFO announcement. Um, all, all I would say is that you know, we are very wary of that because when have you ever known the government to tell you the truth about anything? Mm -hmm. Why are they all of a sudden going to start now? If they announce anything, if they present any being of any kind to us, I would question it because um, you know normally they only do things that are in their own interests and there'll be something more behind it. On the face of it, it will seem like a, um, an amazing thing. It will seem like, you know, um, like it's for us, it's for our benefit. It's a good thing. We've established interplanetary relations and stuff like that. That's already established, you know, this stuff's been going on for a long time. Um, and as, as Mick says, you know, occasionally we get contacted, we do get stuff come through. We're not um, special in any way. This is open to everybody, it's just whether you tune into it or not. Um, but so just be very wary of whatever the government comes up with because there's always something more behind it. So what is the illusion? So we've called this talk Beyond the Illusion. Um, through our experiences, you know, we've come to realise, as, as we've already said, that there is so much more to life than what we, well, what people tend to generally be aware of. Um, we've had so many experiences to, to not know that, and um, uh, you know, many things that we come across confirm what we've experienced. The illusion to us, I mean, it's many things really, but you know, I suppose to sort of break it down quickly, it's the, it's the illusion that, that humanity is just born to work all its life and then die and then that's it. That's the only point to life and, you know, that's definitely not right. Um, the fact that, you know, we're kind of convinced that we're nothing special and we are, you know, we've, we've got so many great capabilities and so many things that we are capable of, but we've been shut down over time deliberately. Um, and uh, uh, the fact that, you know, we think that physically as a human being we think we're free but there are so many things that are imposed upon us that it's almost impossible to be free and operate <coughs> freely when there are so many rules and uh, regulations and so many uh, things imposed in your life you don't get to choose um, or make your decisions freely because there's a lot of stuff that influences that um, so there are many things I mean you know if we go on about what is the illusion there are so many illusions Right, the all see now, so we, we've, we've touched on the, the Anunnaki. Basically going back into ancient times, into the times of Babylon, Samaria, we had this race of beings that came uh, for various reasons, one of them mined for gold. They uh, still operate today. Throughout time, they've manipulated themselves into positions of power, into areas such as banking, media, politics, royalty, military. Um, every area that has any sort of say over, over humanity they are normally at the helm of it because they've manipulated themselves over time into that position. Uh, they are basically the hidden hand in everything, in, in all of humanity's affairs, um, and they are kind of you know pulling the strings from behind the scenes. You know, a lot of people will know this as, as the Illuminati, um, that's one name. Um, you know, they operate secretly from the shadows, the shadow government, and a lot of stuff that, uh, that's happening at the moment in the world tends to have that hidden hand behind it. They use a lot of symbolism. Obviously this symbol, I think most people are aware of this, but just in case anybody isn't, 
you know, we've got the all-seeing eye there. That's uh, representative of um, knowledge and power and, uh, you know, being able to see through the reality. The enlightenment around it represents enlightenment. They see themselves as the top of the pyramid on top of the rest of us. At the bottom there, that's supposed to be us lot underneath them, subservient. Uh, but things are changing as we can see the world is starting to wake up. So this is a symbol that we see throughout, eh? uh, throughout uh, everywhere, the media. Uh, top left there, we've got the Olympic uh, mascots for 2012. Um, yeah, most people would say, oh, they're just look innocent, but when you look at who's behind this stuff and who's behind the designs and who's behind the Olympics, you start to see uh, what's going on. And we've got two things there that uh, look very alien for a start. And then we've both got this one big all seen eye, you could say. You could say. We've got MI5 intelligence badge there at the very top. If you can see, you've got the uh, you've got the all seen eye on the top of the pyramid once again. Then we've got Nickelodeon Children's Channel, something I used to watch when I was younger. It's absolutely riddled with Illuminati symbolism, all seeing eyes, and even the um, the arrow thing there. It's a that's come from this, is it the Statsy? The Statsy from the yeah. When you look into it, it all comes back to the same point. CBS News Reality, um, yeah, all seeing eyes, their logo. Then we've got Wall Street, we've got the pyramid on top of Wall Street there. The eye in the middle there at the bottom, this is um, a mosaic at the base of Ground Zero uh, after 9-11. These things were put in, um, you can see pictures of them, I don't know if anyone's ever been visited. We haven't yet, but these go all around the, uh, the tube station, the uh, Ground Zero. And uh, you've got this one, and then the one next to it is wide open as if it's in terror, as in absolute shock. I mean, they're just not nice things, but they're there supposedly to commemorate 9-11. Um, but I think we, you know, we could come up with something a little bit more respectable because those things are just very eerie. They're not very nice at all, and not the kind of thing really you want to commemorate such an event. And then obviously the dollar bill. You know, I think we've all seen this. Um, you know, we all seen our the pyramid, the Nouveau Order Seclorum, New World Order, Order Out of Chaos, which is their motto. And then moving on into other areas and the TV and the music industry. Um, then we can see that there. Um, top left we've got CSI New York. Um, I haven't seen this episode, but obviously in the background there you can see the all-seen eye with the enlightenment all around it once again. We've got uh, Lady Gaga, uh, quite famous for her Illuminati symbolism in her videos and uh, rituals that she performs during her performances. Actually, at the top there, you can see behind, uh, it's, it's not that clear, but it's uh, somebody wearing a denim jacket, and on the back of that jacket, there's an all-seeing eye with the enlightenment coming off it. And also, the symbol that she's doing there. It's Madonna. Sorry? It's Madonna. Madonna. Top right. Okay. The one with that denim jacket. Top right. Okay, I can't. can't yeah, it's one in the back of the Yep, top right, it's Lady Gaga. She's doing this one. Um, this, uh, to most people, means okay. Uh, to the Illuminati, this means six, six, six. Okay, uh, something that you see quite regularly throughout her videos. Um, and obviously, the centre picture is Lady Gaga once again. She's doing a lot of all seeing eye symbolism. Jay Z, bottom left, he's quite notorious for uh, for his Illuminati symbolism. He's quite into it. He's very open about it. And uh, a lot of the pop stars and people have actually um, admitted that they've had to sell their soul to get to the positions that they're in now for this fame and fortune. They've admitted that they have sold their soul, basically, to, to get there. And then bottom right is Madonna. This is from a 1980s film. Um, and on the back of the jacket there is the, the old C9 once again in the pyramid. Then we have our world leaders. Um, it's Again, it's not something that they hide. You know, their associations and their um, allegiance, if you like, is quite open. It's on display. You know, they're all doing this. I think most people know this means. A couple of weeks ago, tell us that it was a sign of protection because it came from the, the bull and the bear symbol. He was he was talking about the um, the cult of the honeybee, and he said that it was a, a symbol of, of, of the bear. Didn't they? As well, this year. Where's me? It's, all, it's also a Freema Freemason sign for satanic horns, and that's what they're doing. Yeah, there's there's three stages. There's that one. 
then there's something like that, and then there's another one tighter, which is basically Freemasons at Tony Corns, and that's what they're, you know, so, sometimes red is red, and it's the intention behind it, and their intention is Tony Corns. I mean, it may well be for, for protection yeah. of some kind, but I mean, they obviously need it, because <laughs> they're all doing it, <laughs> uh, so they, you know, they want to protect themselves, protect their own, so, you know, maybe that is part of it as well, yeah, definitely. Um, it's quite worrying when you see the Pope doing it. You know, what's he doing? Uh, you know, you can see with these, it's, it's not like, um, you know, like just a, a faint hand gesture. They're making quite definite, you know, uh, symbols with these hands, with their hands, very tightly. So it's a deliberate act. Who's the guy I thought Hillary Clinton? Armadillo Jones. Yeah, Armadillo Jacket. Yeah. Yeah, we've got, obviously, got Bush, Obama, we've got Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia Berlusconi, Clinton, uh, Nicholas Sarkozy, the Pope, Amadina Dad, Amadina Dad, and uh, Hillary. Okay, um, their objective, um, again, quite open about it, many videos on YouTube, you can just Google it and you'll find lots and lots of videos. The objective is a new world order. The new world order is basically the objective to obtain a one world government which has uh, um, a one world currency, one world religion, one world army, one world banking system. And obviously at the head of all of this, at the helm of all of this system, will be the same people that are behind the scenes now. The aim is to basically tighten the control. They need to bring everything together because it's easier to control people from a central point that it is, as it is at the moment, which is scattered all over the place, which is why we're seeing Europe coming together, we're seeing uh, the United Nations are getting more and more involved in things. Um, they are, by the way, becoming very fast becoming the world army. Um, you know, just inviting themselves into other people's countries and attacking um, without any mandate. And as uh, President George H. W. Bush says, um, all those years ago, out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. We are now inside the United Nations that performs as envisaged by its founders. Uh, Televised address, September 11th, 1990. The date is significant also. Um, I think most people will know, you know, there's absolutely hundreds, if not thousands, of these quotes on the internet, and you can find them all for yourself. You can actually find the people saying them. Um, so it's no, uh, it's no secret that this is the objective, a new world order. This is actually uh, the picture, by the way, is um, a newspaper clipping that we took uh, a couple of months back from the Daily Mirror. Uh, it's all about China being the winner in Euro army cuts. Uh, new World Order, obviously China are being moved into place at the moment where the New World Order is concerned as a superpower. What's on the cards? Has anybody heard or seen the Illuminati cards? No. Yeah, some people have, some people haven't. Okay, these are a set of cards, playing cards, that were created back in 1995 by a fellow called Steve Jackson. Uh, at the moment, I haven't looked into his background, but these cards, um, there's a lot of stuff on them that uh, sort of seem to predict events that have taken place um, over the years. Um, obviously, we've got, I'll just start from the top left, we've got the bank merger. I mean, that's happening right now, you know, the banks are collapsing and the idea is to <coughs> completely collapse them. So, so eventually they are all become one bank, one central bank. To do that, obviously, we have to, well, they have to, um, you know, take a small steps to get there because if it's one giant step we will all see it and we will all say hang on a minute that's not happening that's not right so they bring it in you know step by step that's what's happening uh we've got the princess diana card um, with all the paparazzi around her then we've got uh, top right is oil spill and, you know we all know what's happened with the bp oil spill which is it's something which has gone out of the media now it's not in our, our focus or our attention but it's something that is uh, still very um, prominent in the Gulf at the moment and is causing a lot of problems for people. People are getting very sick and dying because of what's going on. It's also being uh, whipped up in sort of around the world as well, the pollution from, uh, from the weather. Um, in the bottom centre there, we've got uh, the terrorist nukes, Pentagon. Um, well, they actually said terrorist nuke, but obviously that, that's very similar to 9-11. Um, and there is some suggestion now that what went on with 9-11 is that the, uh, the buildings were um, actually nuked, or some kind of nuclear device was used on them, because they actually turned to dust. People can't understand how these buildings, um, you know, with just normal bombs, turned completely to dust and disintegrated. 
you know, no, no trace of any plane, no trace of any wreckage, no trace of any people. Um, so, the, you know, there's some suggestion that it was a lot more than just a bomb. Um, the only one we have... Same as I... Oh, right. Um, bottom left, foreign aid. Now, as you can see on that picture, there's an alien handing bags of money to all the different nations. <laughs> Once again, bear in mind what's going on with the UF, UFO stuff at the moment and the disclosure projects and different things because, as I say, they're not in the habit generally of telling us the truth. There's some <laughs> suggestion that um, these alien beings are going to be presented to us as our saviours. Um, that's what that seems to suggest to me anyway. Mm. So it's just worth bearing in mind if that ever does come about. Um, and then bottom right, we've got population reduction, which for this one world system, there's just too many of us for, for them to cope with. They are, over time, slowly trying to reduce the population. And the idea is to reduce it by about 95%, 90%, which is, you know, that's a, that's a big, uh, that's a big lot of people to get rid of. I think we're on about 7 billion-ish at the moment, switching 7 billion population. They want to get it down to about 500 million. Um, I'll just say that it's not going to happen because, you know, these, this is what's planned. This is, you know, They've got these plans, but plans don't always go to plan. And uh, you know, they think that they've got it in the bag, but they haven't because look at what's going on around the world. People are waking up. It's not easy for them to get this through anymore. And actually, uh, it's suggested that they're well behind with these uh, with this agenda, uh, many many years behind. And people are waking up quick, more quickly and quick, uh, sorry, quicker and quicker these days. So uh, it's just not going to. I know we're very positive. We're very positive that you know this stuff is planned. But it doesn't mean it's going to happen, um, you know. And we certainly don't feel that it will get to the point that it thinks it's going to get to. Georgia Guidestones, <coughs> Georgia, America. Um, the early 1980s, these were commissioned and built. They are uh, uh, some standing stones which have um, some guides written on them in several modern languages and several ancient languages. And it sets out basically some rules. Um, number one on the list is, and obviously the most popular, is to maintain humanity under 500 million, which we've already spoken about. In balance with nature. Right. In balance, in, is in perpetual balance with perpetual nature. Balance. Yeah. 500 million, I mean, this is, you know, that's a, that's a lot of people uh, to get rid of. Um, so they're not, you know, it's not hidden, it's not hidden from us. They actually believe in their occult belief system. They have, have to. You not, have you not read into the name of, of the, the gentleman who. Commission. RC Christian. RC Christian, yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of secrets in there, I think. But um, yeah, Ross Christian Christian, I think when it's traced back goes into the same roots again, doesn't it, into this this occult stuff. I think it's a complete hoax, to be honest. RC Christian is in like, you know, right wing. Yeah, it's absolute joke. It's probably commissioned by someone like Robert Anton Wilson because he was a bit of a joker. And uh, wrote a lot about the Illuminati and you know thought he you know at least promoted himself as a member of the Illuminati and you know that was kind of his sort of humour. <laughs> there you go, maybe then, maybe. Yeah, well he was a rich man. He was a friendly fan of his ideas. Okay, um, Bohemian Grove again. I think most people are aware of this. This is a place where a lot of the uh, um, world leaders, um, heads of corporations um, gather two weeks for uh, two weeks of the year in July. They attend this uh, this sort of boys club uh, where they attend what's called the cremation of care ceremony, where they're seen to throw off their cares and uh, you know um, burn them. Um, you know, actually, they they worship a forty foot owl, which is called Monarch, and um, this is one of their gods. Um, and this. Uh, they, they sort of like do a, a, a mock human sacrifice, um, burning an effigy under this owl, uh, which is a 3,000 year old Babylonian festival, um, which used to be known as bonefire. When you trace it back, it used to be known as bonefire, which we still, still celebrate today as bonfire, which is just gone. Um, there's a lot of energy created at these things. Um, these people uh, behind the scenes, those that are really sort of in the know, they're very aware of energy, they're very aware of what energy is capable of. And so they manipulate events and um, create energy, particularly negative energy, <coughs> which they use and harness to further their agenda. This is something that was, um, it's, it's very well known, I think, in uh, the times of ancient Rome, 
they used to have mass orgies, and the, ed uh, sorry, the ed energy that they used to create from that was used to forward their own empire. Um, they're, very aware, they're very aware of us, they're very aware of how we're, <coughs> how we're made up. Um, they probably know us better than we know ourselves, and they manipulate that and uh, exploit it. So you have to be very aware of energies because negative energy you know, is uh, it's very powerful as well. So you have to surround yourself with a lot of positive energy and uh, you know, balance things out a bit. Okay, mind, body, spirit. Um, mind, body, spirit to this group is that it's to control the mind, damage the body and to weaken the spirit. And they do it in a number of ways. For the mind, technology, uh, TV, mobile phones, radioactive waves, etc. Um, technology has fast replaced our natural abilities. Um, for instance, um, when we want to speak to somebody now, we pick up the phone and call them. Whereas if we were still in touch truly 100% of our abilities, we could telepathically communicate with people. That's how it used to be. That's how it can be again. The abilities are still there. They're just dormant because they've shut down over time from various things. Um, body, obviously we're, we're poisoned with a number of things, uh, food, water, the air, vaccinations, the contents of vaccinations, um, known to be poisonous to the human body, genetically modified foods which are designed to genetically modify us from the inside out, the idea is to, is to scramble our DNA, uh, which is our connection to out there, and the <coughs> idea is to shut that off. They're absolutely terrified that we're going to wake up, and they're throwing all of these things at us to stop it from happening. But, as I was speaking with somebody earlier on, we can override this stuff, but the first step is to be aware of it. When you're aware of it, you can do something about it. If you're not aware of it and you don't know what's happening, you don't know to do anything, um, but at least by being aware of it, you can have the, you know, you have the choice whether you want to do anything about it or not, and you can override this stuff. Uh, spirit, um, false flag terrorist events, um, media, negativity, but the suppression of free energy and knowledge, fluoride, which will come on to shortly. <coughs> when these things happen, you know, for instance, 9-11, you know, it's, it's, it's terrible, and the energy that's created is absolutely horrendous, which is harnessed by them and used. <coughs> you know, it really sort of does break the spirit when these things happen, um, because, you know, you think you're getting somewhere, and all of a sudden something like that happens, and it absolutely, you know, crushes people. Um, and then the media, negativity, it's always constant negativity, you know, it's uh, very rarely do you get any good news. The news is all negative and you get the occasional token positive news story, uh, but it's generally negative. Okay. Uh, suppression of free energy, you know, people are, uh, people are starving because they can't afford food. People are dying in their own homes because they can't afford to heat their, their own house up. Um, you know, all these things that are taking place. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, it's breaking people's spirit. Uh, fluoride, which I've put there, um, because actually there is a, again, I was speaking to somebody earlier, fluoride, uh, it has the physical effects on us, but it's also designed to target us spiritually, and we'll come on to that uh, shortly. Just to pick one example, I know we've all probably been here and, and we know about this stuff already, so I'm just going to quickly skip over it. Chemtrails, this is something we've carried over the last sort of 12, 18 months. Um, you know, we're seeing them all the time now, and you know, it's proven to have um, this cocktail of aluminium, barium, and mercury, again, which are all poisons to the body. And strontium. And strontium. Strontium. Okay. Um, you know, we haven't been told about this, we haven't been cons cons consulted or asked to. You know, if we agree to this, it's just been put upon us. Some authorities are now starting to admit that they, uh, they are spraying it. Um, and the excuse is that they're using it because it's helping to fight uh, global warming. Yeah. Apparently the aluminium refracts the sun back up and, you know, we don't get the sun and, and you know, it stops it from damaging the atmosphere and blah, blah, blah. Uh, the sun is also very important, which we, we could come on to in, in, a, in a little while, but um, to us physically and spiritually. So is it any wonder they're trying to block it out and that they advise us to stay out of the sun as much as possible? Mm. No. Or right, I'm just going to quickly read through this. This is to do with fluoride and the spiritual connection. And we're all aware of what fluoride does to us physically, but are we aware that there's a spiritual, um, it's targeting us spiritually as well. 
Um, this has been taken from a website, Dr. Susan Carroll's of multidimensions.com. It says, the super chakra is often known as the third eye. However, according to the postulates of yoga, the pituitary gland of the sixth chakra and the pineal gland of the seventh chakra must join their essence in order to open the third eye. The pituitary gland is called the seat of the mind, with the frontal lobe regulating emotional thoughts, such as poetry and music, and the interior lobe regulating concrete thoughts and intellectual concepts. On the other hand, the pineal gland is known as the seat of illumination, intuition and cosmic consciousness. The pineal gland is to the pituitary gland what intuition is to reason. It controls the action of light upon our body. The pineal gland is located in the posterior end of the third ventricle of the brain, and the pituitary gland is located in the roof of the third ventricle. It is said that the joining of the essences of these two glands in the third ventricle is what opens the third eye. The pituitary gland is responsible for activating our lessons and the beginning of sexuality, and the pineal gland checks the pituitary gland to prevent premature sexual awakening. Second, human thought is regarded as a result of suspended action, and the pineal gland inhibits the immediate discharge of the thoughts into action. This inhibition causes us to look inward and to deeply ponder our actions and reactions. This introversion of, or is indispensable for self-realisation as it displaces our attention from the outer world to the inner. When the external world disappears, our circle of consciousness contracts because our primary attention is focused upon our inner self. It is this inner attention that magnetises spiritual light into the pineal gland. It is known as the mystical marriage. The mystical marriage initia initiates the birth of our multidimensional consciousness and our conscious passage into the fifth dimension and beyond. The rising Kundalini pulls the energy up from Mother Earth through the nerve channels into the medulla oblongata, through the pons area of the brain and then down into the pituitary gland behind the eyes. The increasing pituitary radiation is then passed through the third ventricle to awaken the pineal gland, which has received light from the higher dimensions. The feminine Earth energy, energy merges with the masculine pituitary gland and the feminine pineal gland receives the masculine unmanifest energy from spirit. When the two awakened chakras essences meet in the third ventricle, there is, this, there is the union and harmony of spirit into matter as the multidimensional forces of spiritual light merge with the matter of our third dimensional brain. Now, I know that's a mouthful to lot to take in. Basically, what happens with fluoride is it targets the pineal gland, it, acc it accumulates in the pineal gland more than any other part of our bodies, and you know, we're all made up of, of different levels. It's not just the physical us, there's the mental us, the spiritual us, the emotional us. When one thing goes wrong in one area, it often has an effect and reverberates out through the other um, areas. So by, by uh, attacking us physically, our, our pineal gland, our third eye, which is our connection through to other realities, uh, by attacking that in the physical, it will have an effect on the other level spiritually as well. Remember, they don't want us to wake up spiritually, because if we do, you know, we'll see the world for what it is, and we'll see the illusion for what it is. Just very quickly, um, flaxseed oil, um, there's some books there if anyone wants to have a look afterwards. Uh, something that we've come across um, and looked into, flaxseed oil is apparently a lifesaver. It's um, when used in a certain way in conjunction with uh, protein. It, uh, it is a uh, preventative and a cure for things like cancer, uh, diabetes, arthritis, uh, heart infarction and many other things. Um, the doctor that discovered this did a lot of research into it and used it on her patients. Um, I think she yeah. says works not yeah, Dr. Joanna Budwick, if you look into her, she's um, you know, this is written a very long time ago, but it's uh, still appropriate today. Um, you know, just a simple thing, a simple seed, you know, and the oil from that seed um, does a lot for us. Um, you know, natural health, we want to be able to start healing ourselves, we want to stop relying on big pharma and all these uh, chemical cocktails that they keep feeding to us that only really um, mask the symptoms of what are going on with us, they never actually get to the root of the problem. You know, if we can use nature and stay as close to nature as possible to heal ourselves, um, then we're getting there. Is it any wonder then we've got Codex Alimentarius, which is the global food code, which aims to crack down on herbal remedies and natural healing and things like that. Um, something that's coming to force now, um, you know, especially over here. You know, people that, uh, that, that want to sell herbal remedies have to be licensed. It costs them a fortune, an absolute fortune to be able to get licensed. So again, we're going to end up beyond being able to go to certain places to get these herbal remedies, and uh, you know, not not always of the of the purest kind. Um, you know, there's a lot more to that, but I'm aware of the time now. So um, just have a, a Google of that. If anyone wants to know more, you know, wants to write this down for you, just come and see us, and we will do. 
just a uh, no, no, I'll skip the whole thing. It's a bit long-winded. So it's not thing here. <laughs> right, and just quickly, how's the world changed? Um, you know, we've got to get our heads out of the sun. There's a lot of people going around, and you know, they're either not aware of it or they don't want to be aware of it. Um, you know, and we need to sort of get up and face what's going on because I think if we need to change things or we want to change things, we've got to face it. A lot of this stuff, you know, is perceived as fearful. Um, but does that mean then that you have to turn and run from it? Because, you know, we feel that you have to face these fears head on, um, you know, to get to a point where they're no longer fearful. Um, fear, you know, when you feel fear, it's something within you that you need to look at, you need to deal with. Um, so many people look at this information and say, oh, you shouldn't look at it, it's, it's negative, it's fearful. Um, you know, if you don't give it any energy, it, it will be all right, it will go away. And I say that, you know, um, I've only just become aware of this stuff over the last couple of years, but it's all still happened throughout my lifetime and got to the point where it's at now. Um, so that doesn't quite work for me. Um, I think we really need to sort of face it and, uh, you know, get on and deal with it. Uh, because there is a, there's a beautiful world waiting for us, but we've just got to get there and take it. And then the big picture, um, you know, everything that happens, good and bad, happens for a reason. You know, we're all here to learn, we're all on the soul journey, and uh, we learn from both positive and negative experiences. At the time when, you know, we go through this negative stuff, it does seem like the end of the world, and a lot of the time, you know, it is in some cases for us, but <clears throat> there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. And what, well, that old saying is, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is true. You know, they're all working together, really. On the bigger picture of it, you know, everything is one. They're not separate. There's no positive, negative, light and dark. Everything is just energy. It's the intention and purpose of that, of that energy. So it's, you know, it certainly helps to be aware of that when you come across this information. We personally come from uh, a position of, of light, if you want to call it that. We dip our toes into the dark stuff because we realise it's part of a package. You need to be aware of everything. You know, the more um, that you're aware of, the more you're able to sort of uh, know what's going on and be able to deal with it. So, <coughs> the bigger picture. And then I'll just pass you around to Mick and we'll finish shortly. It's obvious when you look at the news <coughs> and all the protests, pretty much in every continent, but in most cities in the world, that something's happening. You know, people are, have had enough of, of the system. Something is happening within them to, to encourage them to do these things, to protest or whatever. The sun will have a, a major part to play in the awakening of humanity. As I said earlier, just 20 minutes of sunlight a day will activate your pineal gland, your third eye, and allow you to actually see uh, beyond this five centrality. <clears throat> the sun is going through an active period, which is causing global warming throughout the solar system. But that active period also is sending out informational photons, which is basically again activating our DNA and awakening our brains, awakening humanity. But there's been a, a system in place to divide and conquer us to such an extent we don't even know we live next door to it anymore. And it's basically a concerted effort for, for many years. We need to, to stand together, we need to be united, otherwise we can't do anything about it. This is what the system has done to us through banking, through taxes, through mortgages. Mortgage actually means death grip. This is what the system is doing for us. Uh, we need to realise that, we need to do something about it. We are not slaves, we are free. And as soon as you manage to realise that we can't be controlled, people can't tell us what to do, that's, that's when we will uh, go through the deep vibrations. As it says there, repeat after me, I am free. You are not controlled, you're not controllable, you are all spiritual beings having a human experience. You are all fantastic uh, beings of light. Thank you very much for your time. So, we've got about five or six minutes before the landlady gets a chuck us out, so it's kicking on here. Yeah? So, um, have you got any questions? By all means. If you don't mind. So. Yeah, that's fine. Why are you boom, or why? Leg it? Clear up. Okay. How do we stop the boys in blue, the boys in blue, <laughs> coming and controlling us from living our three dark lives that we've been destined here to be? Unfortunately, the, unfortunately, the police, like anybody else, are programmed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they are given orders, and if they don't follow them, they get sacked.
and your family and your pension and, and your mortgage depend on it, Money. then mm -hmm. exactly, you know, pay for the pictures on for as long as, as that happens. So we're going to do it. Yeah, I suppose it's going to, yeah, do have a shelter free moment. Yeah, we're definitely into that stuff. But I think it's going to come with education for police officers. I mean, that's mm. certainly something we're trying to do, you know, with, with some of the colleagues that we're still in touch with. We're trying to sort of educate them as to, you know, the free man stuff and, uh, you know, common law, the difference between common law and statute law. Because, you know, we don't mind admitting and putting our hands up and saying that we know more about the law now than we did when we were officers. <laughs> because, you know, you're just not taught it seriously, not taught that kind of stuff. Um, you kind of had your, you know, your bread, bread and butter laws that you do day in, day out. You don't even need to know anything else, but you should do. And um, that's where it needs to change. We need to, you know, police need to be educated. It's worth saying, it's not just police, is it? Because there are nurses out there that aren't treating patients because yeah. they want to talk, you know, there's... This isn't just a one no, dimensional thing. Into your house with force. No, but they drop your mom on the floor, they drop your mom on the floor, and they falsify the records. Yeah, yeah. That's what we need to be able to deal with. We'd be able to move through you. Yeah, I think there's good and bad in all of them walks of life. Go on, what, five minutes. Who in the hierarchy during your training informs the police that they've got the right to assault the general public? The egos of the individual. Oh, no, no, no. This is pathological, this is systemic. They have now been given the right to rubber uh, to fire rubber bullets at the students. Where is there a law written that says the police have the right to assault people? And why have you been told that, or your colleagues when you were there being told that? Where do they get that from? The, the only guidance you get is reasonable force, <laughs> but reasonable okay. is a dark area. You know, if somebody's coming at me with a knife then my reasonable force will be much higher than if somebody isn't coming with I'm talking life. about somebody who's having a, 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 an intellectual debate with a police officer who gets slammed to the ground. That is, that's assault, that's criminal is, assault, as far as I'm concerned. It is. That is Why don't they know that? I think, I think to a certain extent they do know that, but when people put the uniform on, some people can't handle power. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the individual ego, isn't my, it? My, my fear is with, an out, with, you, with the police being outnumbered at 600 to 1, they'll just be massacred. Right, You'll be wiped out. Yeah. Right, did you see the Stanford experiment? No, no. Stanford experiment? Yes. Um, check that out. Um, it was in the 70s, was it? Oh, yeah. Basically yeah. saying, you know, that idea when you put the uniform on, how you go. Oh, sure. I actually know a policeman, I know some people who actually, that they think that's real. Yeah. actually. Can you like can you just um, explain to me something you said very early on in the talk? Mm -hmm. Um how like I know that the police are targeted on arrests, you know, can you bring so many arrests in a quarter or whatever? Um, how were they justifying you not arresting individuals? If you're targeted on your arrest rates, you were saying that um, you were being told that you couldn't arrest people that you knew had drugs on them. How did they justify that? They didn't. They, they just basically said, if you target people who you know are carrying drugs, it reflects badly on the crime figures, so I don't do it. Because I, I thought the idea was, meet these figures. It's the government mm -hmm. likes the drugs so being passed around, obviously. The they're, selling them. <laughs> they're selling them. They're selling them. <laughs> Can I, can I ask what, what your personal views are on drugs and the use of uh, cannabis and stuff like that? <laughs> my, my personal view is what's grown from nature can't be bad for you. That, that's my personal view. Well, you've gone over. A bit more of a comment rather than a question. Um, I think a lot of people are asking, what can we do? And uh, my, my personal view is that uh, everything is consciousness, and energy is a form of consciousness. And um, I think that the idea of, um, you know, everybody has to, to, to come together and make the decision and, and work in one direction probably isn't necessary. Um, it's, a, it's just a question of enough of us raising our vibration. And using the idea of the hundredth monkey principle, if enough of us have raised our vibration, then that will spread across the world. So I, I think it's more about um, you know the ones that are awake. We need to raise our vibration um, and and you know have that ripple effect uh, through the hundredth monkey syndrome. Mm -hmm. 
um, affect the rest of uh, the people who are asleep. So it's not so much of a question, but more of a kind of a statement. Got another one here. Uh, similar to what you're saying, actually, is um, instead of, say, ed trying to educate the police force, maybe it might be best to send energy, sort of positive intentions to the people who are highest in authority. And if you can do that, if they, if they go through a transformation, it's more likely to filter down the lower ranks. So, I mean. Yeah. Again, enough people need to get together and do that because, yeah. you know, we can affect things energetically as well. Mm -hmm. But there needs to be enough energy being directed at it. So, yeah, definitely. Agree. Actually, carrying on from that, on 11 11, there is a meditation that's yeah. taking place as well at um, a hardened space um, at Fletcher's Walk. So, at 7 o'clock, if anybody's interested, do come along. Uh, Friday. Okay. Just, yeah. just find the space, sit down, and get a bit contemplative, let's see if the intelligent experiment worked. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. There was just good to move. Yeah, I was, was going to just ask a couple of questions. Things. Um, how did you feel that, because obviously with the police uniforms, you had bad, um, the, the black and white thing, which is to do with, with Masonic. Um, obviously, because you've done a bit of research, probably now, and realised that you were sort of symbols as well with your black and white and different things and the numbers and to do, to do with the police and uh, also to do with, do you know much about the, the connection with Saturn? Have you heard about any of that? Um, I'm very brief, I don't know. I don't know about a lot of The Masonic symbol was something we found out subsequently as well. Yeah, go on, go on, Oz. <laughs> I'm interested in where you get all your where, where do you get all your information from? You know about Ashtar and that. There's so much stuff on the internet. How do you sift out the the good stuff from the dodgy stuff? It, have you got some personal source of information? Yes, Ashtar himself. <laughs> you found him Ashtar himself. Channel messages, in, intuitive information. Did you seem pretty sure about all, all your information? Yeah. I mean, I've been reading it. story is 100% sure. Yeah. yeah. Story, yeah. yeah. That's, everyone's story is definitely their own truth. So, how come they can't challenge you to do kind of like citizens' arrest on all the people that you know are committing crimes? <laughs> we have more powers of arrest than the police. Well, the citizens' power. Yeah, but how could you say that then? Who? We personally? Yeah. Who, who, who do you want us to arrest? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> 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 she carries a list. <laughs>